City University Television. In association with the Center for Advanced Study in Theater Arts. And the Harold Thurman Endowment. Present Spotlight. Welcome to Spotlight. I'm Ed Wilson, and my guest is one of America's best-known film, television, and stage performers, Mr. Tony Randall. Tony, thank you for being here. You came back to Broadway in the play M. Butterfly after having been away from the Broadway stage for 25 years. What did it feel like coming back after all that time? Well, <laughs> I've never been off stage. I've I've been playing everywhere else but Broadway. Felt the same. Really? No, no, <laughs> yes. no different? No different at all, no. Well, then, I have to ask you this, because the part you played in M. Butterfly, yes. Rene Gallimard, which had to be a very challenging part. It's a, I must say, you were fascinating in the role. It's, a, it's an incredible role. Uh, this man who has been in love with this image of this person who he feels is a woman and turns out to be a man all these years, mm -hmm. this French diplomat, uh, what about that role? Uh, have you ever played any part like that before? No, there's never been a part like that before. It's an actor's dream. For one thing, you're on stage throughout. Yeah. <laughs> no actor objects to that. But the, the play is, um, and the part, are such an extraordinary dramatization of an idea, at least from my point of view. Any play that's a rich play, a good play, is susceptible to numerous interpretations, all of them uh, legitimate, if they are legitimate. <laughs> but uh, my interpretation is that this is a play about blind faith. This meaning the man in love with this uh, Chinese opera singer mm -hmm. whom he believes to be a woman. Blind faith that she is his ideal woman? That's right. And the, the need for belief, the need for love, and the need for belief that's in human beings. I don't find any of it hard to believe. I see it around me every day of my life, everywhere. So there was no mental adjustment for you as far as... No, you just have to find within yourself that same need to believe, blindly, even in something ridiculous. How many times have you said of someone, uh, a married couple, what does he see in her? Or what does she see in him? She th he thinks she's beautiful. Or he did. Right. <laughs> uh, but I think in life... In, in, especially in love, it fades. But in this case, it never fades. But how many, how m everybody in the world thinks everybody else's religion is absurd. Yet people will die for their beliefs. So you, all you had to do was to find that incorporate belief. that belief in René Gallimard. That's what every actor has to do in any part. Find what he thinks is the essence of the part and then find that in himself. Once you've found it in yourself, you're there. Finding it can be very was difficult. Was that hard in this part? No, no. Because of what could, we were just talking about? Well, uh, it, was, it was very close to my heart. And I, really? I could tap right into it from the first rehearsal. Do you have certain beliefs that you, things that you believe yes. that you do? Blind, loving, foolish, in fact, total infatuation really? from birth, faith. Are, yes. they, are there some of these you could share with us? Or I you? believe in theater. Right. Now, tell me what, explain that a little bit. When you say you believe in theater, you mean the power of it, the beauty of it, what, uh, just the, when you say I believe in theater, as, a, as an experience, or? I'll tell you, I'll tell you without telling you my story. Okay. I have a friend, a boy I knew all my life. He was an actor. He was enormously gifted. All of us who knew him believed in him. He, he had a touch of genius comic genius as an actor. He never got anywhere. He never got to first base, and he died of a broken heart. He loved it all his life, and it never loved him. That's a, that's a very sad story. It's a tragic story. Really. Yes. But he never gave up, even never though he didn't get Until the day he died, kept believing it would happen. And believing it was that important and that powerful. Yes. So you were able to, in terms of you in this part... I've been luckier. 
well, in my life. Yeah, you've never, yes. you've never stopped. I've never been out of work, but uh, and I've been successful. He deserved success. His gifts and his his commitment were such. Do you think the profession, do you think the art form, is that quixotic, that... Uh... The profession and the art form are two totally different, two totally unrelated things. So he was an artist, but he was not able to make a living That's professionally. That's right. Columbia Pictures was owned by Coca-Cola. It's no different than television, and it's no different on the stage. Uh, it's all commercial. It's all business. That has nothing to do with the art. Nothing whatsoever. So this man was an artist, but, but yes. because of this context, because of the framework, the commercial framework, he never was able he, to make... He never it. got a break. And our business is such that you have to get a lot, not only a lucky break, but a lot of lucky breaks to get anywhere. He never got a lucky break. And you, of course, you've been... I've been lucky. But you, well, you've always also been able to make the most of those uh, opportunities. So he could have, too. And we all knew it. All his friends knew it. I called up Carl Reiner, who was a mutual friend when he died, and I said, you read that it's so and so? He said, he said, the most gifted guy I ever knew who never made it. And so everybody had the same feeling about yeah. it. Yeah. Let me come back briefly to Rene Gallimard mm -hmm. and M. Butterfly, because you spoke about how you tapped and found uh, the resources to believe in that part, in mm -hmm. that man, that character. Yeah. What about performing for the audience? Because that is a part in which you speak directly to the audience. Yes. And how was it in terms, were there some audiences more receptive, more responsive than others? What was no, that? No, they're all the same. Really? They're all matinees, the same. Matinees, evening, weekends? Well, ma especially, uh, except for the Wednesday matinee, which is almost entirely old ladies. <laughs> 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 and I don't know what they make of that play, especially when the g girl talks about the male member, you know, and all that. They, sometimes they go, oh! <laughs> Or they simply sit there and don't believe a word. They don't believe I'm here listening to this. <laughs> but most audiences are very, very responsive. And at the end, it's an unusual thing. The end, the, they stand and cheer. I've only seen that once before in the theater. And does, does that happen night after night? Every performance. Really? Yes. That must feel pretty... Uh, oh, wonderful. Wonderful. But it, you, you've been through a lot of twists and turns before you get to that point in that play. Yes. Because you have to play a, a young man, you have to play this person going through a whole series Oh, that's of why it's an actor's dream. You get to do everything in full view of the audience. No theatrical tricks, no putting on makeup or changing. Everything happens right there yes, in front of the audience. Yes, you take clothes off and put yes, them on right in, in front of in the, the audience. In the Oriental theater fashion, and which is also the Shakespearean theater fashion. And uh, audiences instantly understand them. They like that. I want to go back now to when you first started. You grew up, what, Tulsa, Oklahoma? Tulsa. When did you first know you wanted to be an actor? And how did you first know? You, you, you talked about this faith and this belief in theater, but did that start very early for you? No. I just knew I wanted to be an actor. All young actors know they, they want to act. I want to act. Yeah. I can act. Let me act. And it's, it's a kind of showing off. Let me show what I can do. Let me show how good I am. Later on, you begin did to you, Did you, was this when you were like in high school, you felt this? Earlier, you, when really? I was 12 or 13. First time I ever saw a play was in high school, was in junior high, I suppose it was. About ninth grade, something like that. And I saw the kids put on Penrod. I'd never seen a play before. And I knew that they were terrible and I could do, <laughs> I could do it. Right. I just knew I could do it. I could do it better than any of them. And I've always felt that way <laughs> ever since. I've only seen three or four performances in my life where I didn't think, oh, I could do that. <laughs> and but do it better. Do it better. Uh, uh, two or three times I've said, oh, my God, I could <laughs> never do that. What never. Were, what were, can you remember some of them? Oh, yes, when I saw Marlon in Streetcar. I was playing in, I, I, I'm a lucky man. I've had a nice life, and I, and God put me together in a happy way. I, I have no, uh, envy in my nature. That's the truth. Well, that's uh, it's quite unusual, especially for an actor. I suppose so, but uh, it's not in my nature, and I've never felt that way about any other person. But when I saw Marlon in Streetcar, and I was playing down the street with Miss Cornell in Antony and Cleopatra, which was a magnificent production, wonderful actors, and after all, such a play. And one matinee, we went to see Streetcar. I was ashamed to go back to my and I couldn't sleep. 
Here, this kid, he was four years younger than I, and I was just a kid, he was doing something that I'd never seen an actor do in my life, and that I knew if I lived to be a hundred, I'll never be able to do. And after four nights, I got up in the middle of the night, I went in the bathroom, and I hung over the toilet and got sick. And my wife came in and said, well, you've made yourself sick with jealousy. Are you satisfied? <laughs> and that was it? That was it. So, well, are there a few other performances that you felt not jealous of, but that you... That I know I could never do? Yes. Yes, yes. More than a few. Olivier, of course, in uh, Othello. That was... That was tremendous. And Lee Cobb in a play called Clash by Night by Clifford Odess. And Ethel Waters in Mamba's Daughters. Oh. And um, Laurette Taylor in everything I saw her in. Uh, Did you see her in Outward uh, Bound? Uh, Glass and Menagerie. Glass Menagerie, yes. That was extraordinary. That was a different kind of acting. And uh, Paul Lucas in uh, Watch on the Rhine. You That's about it. That's, <laughs> that's an impressive list, but it's mm -hmm. also not that long a list if you no. consider all the things you've seen. No. You left Tulsa and you went to Northwestern. Northwestern University. To study theater specifically? I thought I was studying theater. I entered the School of Speech and we studied speech. Wonderful speech teacher. She's still teaching, Lois Cruz. And she, uh, she taught me speech. Uh, and if I have good articulation, it's because of Lois Cruz. But after a while, I learned that that wasn't what acting was. And the head of the university theater, whose name was Garrett Leverton, advised me to quit and go to the neighborhood playhouse in New York. He said, you don't move well on stage, and you'll study with Martha Graham at the neighborhood playhouse, and you'll learn how to move. And he was right. But he didn't mention that I'd study with Sanford Meisner, who would teach me how to act. So that was a byproduct, really. You went... I went for Martha Graham, Graham, and Meisner made an actor out of me. What kind of was, was, as a teacher, because you were there, that was an extraordinary period. Mm -hmm. He had some exceptional students. Uh, and he was exceptional, he was young. And he was playing that every, every night we'd go see him play in the theater. That, it, that was a different what, thing. And then the group theater, if you please, which was, was, were, which were was they, good. Were they active at that point? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And of course that was Harold Clerman and uh, directing, but then all those uh, amazing people who were in the group theater. And you Wonderful. were able to see them night after night? Night after night, yes. With S Meisner, what did, was it uh, the whole range of things, improvisation, you, scene work, were you working on all aspects of, of acting? When exactly you that. Him? You begin with the simplest thing. The simplest thing, I suppose it's like a violinist just drawing the bow across an open string. Well, that's hard to do. <laughs> <laughs> and when you become a master violinist like Itzhak Perlman, you still have some music where it's an open string and you have to draw the bow across it. That's hard to do. The simplest thing in acting, the first step, is to come into a room for a reason. That's hard to do. Right. <laughs> and, so, and you still have to do that. No matter what role you're right. playing, you come there for a reason. reason. <laughs> and you have to know that reason. You have to invent it. In many cases, you have to invent it. In, in many cases, the playwright it's clear the playwright brings you on for a reason. Sometimes the playwright brings you on for his own reasons. And he needs someone there. So it's not for the character's reason. And no. that's what you have to find. You have, you have to find a life for him sometimes. So you started with Sandy Meisner learning things like that. And I'm still using them. The exactly techniques. as he taught it. I haven't changed one thing he taught really? me. No. Not In all one these thing. years. I'm still trying to do it right. Well, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you must have gotten it right a few times along the way. The, let me, you acted before, you had to go into the Army for four years. Yes. That must have been tough, because it was right at a point where you, you were just really getting started yes. as an actor. You'd yes. been with Ethel Barrymore in The Corn is Green. And I'd been with which, Jane Cowell in Candida. Yeah. And you were rehearsing, I think, in The Skin, Skin of, of Our, our Teeth. Teeth. Yes. You'd been cast in that, which was Tallulah Bankhead with... Um, Frederick Marr, Montgomery Kaza Cliff. And Aaliyah Kazan directing. That's right. And you, what, you got called up? The same day. Same day we began rehearsals, I got my, my greeting. Greeting from the President of the United States. So you had to leave? Yes. I rehearsed one day. <laughs> that was heartbreaking. Well, now, what, when you, so you were away four years. That's right. Now, what, uh, during that time, were you concerned that when you came back, uh, things would be changed totally, or were you not afraid that you could just get back into the profession when you got back from the four years in the Army? Oh, I don't, I don't know if afraid is the word. I um, 
somewhere along the line in there, I completely lost my confidence. And I think many men did. While you were in the Army? No, when I was about to get out of the Army. It, the, I hated the Army. We all did. But it was a very comfortable life. You were in a great womb. Every decision in life is made for you, including what you wore each day, what you ate, when you got up, when you went to bed, when you had a physical examination, when you had your hair cut. Everything was decided for you. Suddenly you're on your own and have to make your living as well. And I went 11 weeks without a job. Just after you got out of the army? Yes, and those 11 weeks put me on the psychiatrist's couch. Really? Oh, they destroyed me. They destroyed me. I thought I'll never, never get rolling. And were, accepting were you, the... Um, <clears throat> were you going to auditions during that 11-week yes, period? Yes, And not being cast? And that's right. And uh, rejected. And, but, but that's another story. I've never passed an audition. Really? No. Well, <laughs> explain that. How do you I, get I don't that? audition well. I, and so, but then you get parts. Well, wh when I began to get parts, then I didn't have to audition anymore. <laughs> but uh, I, I swore to myself, if I ever made it, I would never read for anything again as long as I live. And have you been able to? Absolutely. You've kept that. Oh, it's a terrifying thing, and it just—that was part of the, one of the things that destroyed me. That when getting you, up there and being rejected. You say rejected. that did it literally drive you to the uh, psychiatrist? That's cancer? right. That's right. For how long? Were two you, years. Two years. Were, did you begin to get work though? You must have during that two. I years finally period. got. No, in the end of eleven <clears throat> weeks, I got a job. Henry Morgan gave me a job on his radio show. And. Uh, from then on, I was never out of work. And that's unusual. I never heard of an actor who was never out of work. I, particularly with a career that's, that spanned the time that yours has and the ups and downs in the business. But I all, every week, it, I at least had something, a radio show or a something to pay the rent. So, well, th so but then you really got started in theater as well after that. No, what started? No, well, I was working in theater all that time, just a utility infielder, small parts and shows. What got me moving was television. My entire generation, are, are re we're all really television babies. It was Mr. Peepers that first made me prominent and got, from that I got decent roles on Broadway, not the other way around. That was Wally Cox. Yes. Who was an extraordinary person. Yes. Uh, and that, how long did that show run? Three Mr. years. Three years, that's quite a, that was live television. 139 live shows. Was it was that sort of I guess looking back on it was it traumatic or not the live part of it was well was it exciting the fact that it was oh I uh, loved it yes I much the, preferred it the spontaneity of it yes <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> the flying blind through a storm that <laughs> yeah that was exciting and during the three years of Mr. Peepers I did three Broadway shows there it was was inherit the wind one of them mm -hmm. I went one period of three hundred sixty five <laughs> days without a day off. Never one day off. No, because the show Inherit the Wind was dark on Sundays, and Sundays was the day we did Mr. Peepers. We rehearsed all week, but we did it on Sunday. So we started at 9 in the morning. Did you feel like you needed a vacation? At, or were you so excited about the two things you were doing that it didn't bother you? Never felt better in my life. Never yes. had a cold. Never, never was tired. Got everything else in. Did everything else that you do in life. Tell me, uh, Inherit the Wind, which is the play about the Scopes trial yes. in Tennessee and a, uh, a, about evolution and so mm -hmm. forth. And you played the reporter in that. H.L. Mencken. Which is a, wonderful, was a wonderful, is a wonderful part. Paul Muni was uh, the star of that. What was he like to work with as an actor? And what was he like as an actor? He was an extraordinary acting machine. He was all actor. I don't think he had any other life. He had been an actor since, his parents were actors, he'd been an actor since he was born. He was on stage when he was three, four years old. By the time he was 12, he was playing character parts with long beards <laughs> at, in the Yiddish theater. And he said that with his roller skates on, he'd come in. <laughs> <laughs> and perform. Yeah. As he grew older, he grew more and more strange until acting became the only thing that kept him a social human being at all. And he became more and more withdrawn and he ended up insane. They had to, he had to be put away. He just grew farther and farther mm. from, from um, people. But when you were with him in Inherit the Wind, he, he was not at that stage at that point. No, but uh, we didn't know it, but he was close to it. Really? He hadn't worked for six years. He had just withdrawn. 
This, this had pulled them out of that terrible withdrawal. And for six years, this man with a brilliant mind and a wonderful education had done nothing but look at television, mainly Westerns. He was fascinated by Westerns. He consider, considered them true American mythology. And he told me he had six television sets so that no matter what room he was in, he could sit and look at television. And he did that 12, 15 hours a day. Extraordinary. Yeah. He, he was going through some... <coughs> but Inherit the Wind really did. That brought him out again. Yes, because... And he became, a, he became what he was, an actor. And he was an actor of... I, I don't know how to, to describe it to, to someone who has never seen him. Because if you've seen him in movies, you have no idea what he was like. I don't like him in movies. He, I don't think he was very good. He knew too many tricks. And it, movie acting is instant acting. You're given yes, the scene right. and you shoot it. Right. Rehearse it three times and you shoot it. If you're lucky, they, they take it again. Three or four. Seldom more than four takes. Some, re some directors are famous for many takes. Some never do more than two. But his acting didn't get good until he'd worked on something for a long time. He did... Um, <coughs> Death of a Salesman in London got very bad notices. But people who were in the company, like uh, Kevin McCarthy, Frank Maxwell, and others have told me that if the critics had come back in three weeks... It would have been different. They would have, they would have seen him then. He needed that long to work at it. To get in the part. Yes, to really get in the part. And the same thing happened with Inherit the Wind. When we opened in Philadelphia, he was, uh, he was desperate. He, he was like that. But uh, after we'd played a while, you saw what the man could do. He was, he was a phenomenal actor with perhaps the greatest voice I've ever heard in the theater. When he spoke to you normally like this, you'd feel, it, you'd feel the stage rumble. It was that resonant then. Yeah. And when he went, oh, he'd go up to about an A-flat. You'd have to move your head. <laughs> it was like, it was like a tr someone blowing a trumpet in your ear. <laughs> but the... Uh, the concentration, the, the, he'd sort of go all the way, you know. It, it was almost frightening. He was powerful, powerful. Well, before we leave that period, there were, I'd just like to mention two other performers you were with. You mentioned Catherine Cornell mm -hmm. and Ian Anthony and Cleopatra. What was she like as an actress and to work with? Well, she was a very, very great star and a truly dedicated person of the theater. She was one of the most beautiful women of the century. She, was, she could be compared only to someone like Sophia Loren. Her beauty was... You just, you just stood there gaping. But she never once submitted to the movies. They were after her from the day she started. No, she, she believed in theater. She loved it. She gave her entire life to it. And this commitment, this belief, this love made her an artist. The audiences felt it. Her commitment, her, her, her sense of, of, of need and of doing, the, f the feeling that it was important and must be done. But she wasn't talented. She was committed but not talented. She, she had a, a small talent. It came out best in something that was sentimental, say like uh, the Barretts of Wimpole Street. But she wasn't, an act, uh, she wasn't a genius of an actor, but she more than made up for it by her commitment and artistry. And audiences worshipped her because they felt what she felt, that this, she was like a priestess. This I would die for. So it became a presence rather than a talent, really. That's right. That's right. But I think I would prefer that to someone who has a great talent and fritters it away, has no sense of, of commitment or responsibility. What about Ethel Barrymore? I didn't think much of her. Really? As no. an actress? No, not as an actress, no. Was it tricks? What was it? You mentioned tricks a moment ago. What? I thought it was all old-fashioned tricks. Really? I thought so. Uh, it was a different course, world then. She, she came from a... You had been with Sandy Meisner mm -hmm. when we spoke of the Neighborhood Playhouse. That was a totally different approach to acting, wasn't it, from That's Ethel right. Barrymore? A totally different school. Yes. Because it, it, there was, uh, there, you were supposed to believe. You believed in what you were doing. You found the truth in yes, something. Th these these uh, older stars believed that the theater was made for them. That uh, the audience did not want to see them act, did not want to see them characterized at all, wanted to see them 
came to see them, and the play was written to show them off. But that's gone by and the board. And of course, you have had this opportunity, and we mentioned M. Butterfly, but in of putting yourself into a number of different parts in which you've been able to become someone else totally, because Rene Gallimard is, is someone who is foreign to your own experience in some ways, although you've found connections all, all through. Well, that's what you must do, of course. Uh, Miss Barrymore belonged to a different generation entirely. If I tell you that I never met her, you'd find that hard to believe. I would find it hard to believe. Yes. And so you acted with her, but you never met her. Never met her. We, uh, she was, um, Tony, she was I hate an to empress. Say, we're going to have to go right mm -hmm. now. I hate to say it because I'd like to hear more about this, but we'll do it at another time. Okay. Thank you so much for being with us. This has been Spotlight, and my guest has been Tony Randall. Thank you for being with us.